The learner shall inherit the earth, while the learned will be beautifully equipped to live in a world that no longer exists. To put it another way, successful people constantly learn and grow, and unsuccessful people think that they already know. So if you're here, welcome to the first part of the course that I have promised to deliver in 2021. And I, for one, am excited to get this started. But I want to start with some housekeeping items just to put some things into context. The way that I decided to structure this course is from the perspective of thinking through what I would want to show myself when I first got started. So about 12 years ago, I started the journey to learn about uh, various financial instruments, but also short-term trading and long-term investing. And over the last 12 years, I have made money, lost money, spent um, an extreme amount of time studying these topics and read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books on the subject. Not only just trading, but also success, mindset, psychology, and I've studied some of the wealthiest traders and investors uh, that we have walking the planet or who have previously lived. So this course is a culmination of what I wish I could have shown myself or I wish that I could show myself in the past, what I wish I would have been able to see when I started if I would have been able to actually believe it. And so I wanna to touch on uh, a bit of a sensitive topic before we get started. It, some of you have not yet started trading. Some of you are just, that you're brand new, you're beginners, you're still just trying to dip your toe in the water and see if this is something that you're interested in. Others are interested in investing and others have been trading for quite some time. And so there's a myriad of experience levels. What I would ask you to do is just be open-minded. Go into this as a blank slate. This is my perspective on things. I won't claim that it's right. I won't claim that it's accurate. I won't claim any of those things. What I will claim is that it is authentic. It is what I believe to be true, and it is the culmination of everything that I have learned over the last 12 years. And quite frankly, I wished someone would have shown me what I am about to show you when I first started trading because not only would the balance in my account be significantly different, as in it would be a lot higher, uh, my quality of life over the last 12 years would have been substantially greater. So keep an open mind. One of the things I'm going to introduce in this video is the concept of trading insurance. It's this idea that while you trade, while you prove your trading strategies, while you learn about investing, while you learn about how to put your money to work for you, that you can actually insure against some of the downside risk, actually a lot of the downside risk. So I want you to stay open-minded about that as well because it's a new concept. But before we get started, I must address the concept of success, wealth, and, and what it means to me. A lot of people get into this, pretty much everyone, because you wanna make more money. And it's not that you want money so much as what you want that money to do for you, how it will serve you in your life and the things and the abilities it will give you. But there are other things that we must stay focused on and we cannot neglect if we want to be truly successful. One of those things is your health, right? A healthy body is necessary for any level of success. That has everything to do with the amount of sleep you get, how, what, how and what you eat, and how you exercise and how you move your body. So it's very important. If you want to be successful, it is a holistic approach. It's not just making money. I've heard it said that a man with his health has a thousand dreams and a man without his health has but one. If you do not have your health, you have nothing and it doesn't matter how much money you have. So focus on your health. The next thing, emotions. You, you have to have um, healthy emotions. Many of us struggle with anxiety and depression and things like that. And while you know, none of us are exempt from being subject to those things, we do need to do whatever we can to alleviate the pressure from those things and work towards getting towards a more peaceful and joyful life. Next, I wanna talk about relationships. Real juice, 
the real juice of life comes through these relationships. And these can be relationships through uh, with a partner that you have. It can be with a, uh, a sibling, a parent, a family member, a child, any of those things. We need to pour effort into our relationships. Imagine having all the money in the world, but no relationships or poor relationships. Would you consider yourself successful? I wouldn't. All right. What about a healthy relationship with time and balance? balancing your time. We want to work towards getting a healthy relationship with the time that we have. It is our most precious asset. You'll hear me talk about that over and over again, especially this one topic of trading your time for money. That's not a fair trade, it's not a good trade, and it's something that we want to get away from. Time is our most valuable asset on this planet. Spirituality, often overlooked. Your spirituality can directly impact your success. So there's this thing that dictates our life. It's known as our egos. It's our perception of who we actually are. And information leads to knowledge and knowledge can lead to success. But information, if you break that word down, you're going to see in form. What information serves to do is build up or bolster this current form. But we are more than what the eye can see. There's more depth to us. And so information isn't always what we need in order to be complete. We also need inspiration. If you break inspiration down, you're gonna see in spirit. So feed your spirit, whatever religious background you have, whatever philosophies you live by, I encourage you to live by them to the fullest. Put all of your effort into those things so that you can demonstrate that in your day-to-day -day life. Lastly, before we get started with the course, I wanna talk about some of the things, some of the, the, the mistakes that I made that led me to coming to the conclusions I have in giving you this course. To start off, we're going to start from the top down, all right? We're going to start at a macro level and get more and more granular as we go. So I'm going to cover some concepts that you may find to be a little bit elementary. Uh, but there, remember, there's a wide range of people watching this. And so I want to make sure that I add value to everyone that I can. But when I first got started, I had this urgency to make money. I needed to make money and I needed to make money fast because I wanted to change my circumstances. Because I was so desperate to do that, I believed things that were not necessarily true. And one of those things was that I would be able to grow my money exponentially, literally from the start with very little experience all I needed to do was put in the time, effort, and energy, and the money, and I could have everything that I ever wanted. I encourage you to just be cautious, okay? I'm not gonna advise you on what to do or tell you what you should do with your money. These are suggestions. These are possibly, you know, again, me just sharing my experience and my opinions. But please, if you don't listen to another thing I say, just be realistic with your expectations. We're gonna go over what some of the best performing investors have been able to achieve in their careers during their lifetimes. And I just want us to kind of rein it in a little bit because that's one thing that hurt me more than anything else was thinking that I needed to put all of my money into a strategy that I hadn't fully proven um, in order to grow it so that I could change my circumstances immediately. Almost everything that happens very quickly in your life is bad. And almost everything that is good takes time, effort, and energy. So please don't forget that. Don't fall prey or victim to a get-rich-quick scheme, the idea that wealth can you can fall into this windfall of wealth by uh, just having the right trading strategy that you can implement in a, in a short period of time. Don't do that. Don't look for a magic pill, a magic investment. Anything that is easy is probably not right, all right? And so what I'm gonna cover mainly in this first part of this course is from the investment side and from the trading side, looking at how we can tiptoe into the markets, how we can handle our first years as a trader. Um, if we have been trading for a while, how we can kind of reset learn to trade short-term market fluctuations, but do so in a safe manner. So that if you are like the 98% of people who ultimately fail, or you find yourself in that, that group of people at first, you don't end up losing everything. There's a way to do this while still making profits. And, and I think that's one of the most valuable things that I have to share with you today. So watch this till the end, it's lengthy. 
but the details matter. The details matter, okay? And there's more and more juice the, the longer this video goes, and there's more and more value. So I hope you enjoy this. Please disregard the ads. The ads are the things I had to put in here in order to make this course free. I'm not charging you for any of this information because I have placed ads in this video. So skip them when they come up, bear with me. When I get a little bit lengthy with my words, it's all well-intentioned. I'm telling you things that I think matter. So I hope you enjoy this. I hope this is productive for you. And remember, leave your questions in the comments because I'm going to address every question in the newsletter later on. So if you have a question and you are part of the newsletter, leave that in the comments. And if you have a question and you're not part of the newsletter, leave that in the comments and then send me an email so that I can include you on the newsletter. I'm looking forward to this. I am so excited to be starting the year off with this series and I can't wait to hear your feedback and to just continue to learn and grow with you. So I hope you enjoy this. Let's get started. Welcome to the Trading, Investing, Business and Success course from Profit Market, part one. Let's get started. So here's a quick disclaimer. Essentially what this says is that Profit Market and or its affiliates are not responsible for any losses incurred. What I'm really saying here is this is not investment advice. You should seek your own advice. The information that you are about to see is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Um, and please feel free to read this disclaimer before proceeding. All right, here we go. Let's get started. Money is a good servant and a bad master. Francis Bacon. Money is not what we actually want. We want what we perceive money can do for us. All right. So let's get started on the basis of money and just talk about it because that's why everyone is here. The truth is, is that money is not even real. Will it provide us with freedom we long for? Will it give us the ability to take care of others, the ability to make the changes that we want to see in our communities? We all look at money differently, but one thing is the same for all of us. And that thing is that we either control money or money will control us. Is money a blessing or a burden? And that's the real question. We must learn to control money and to make it serve us rather than us serving it. And the truth is, the vast majority of people will live their lives serving money and not even knowing it. And this leads me to a quote. None are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe that they are free. I believe that this is very accurate and it describes the condition of the vast majority of the world's population. But if we want to control money, if we want to make money serve us, then how do we best do that? Especially when so few people can accomplish this. The methodology that I take, and typically... If a person wants to get better at something, they'll take the same route, is to find another person who's mastered the subject, and then try to duplicate their efforts and advice. And doesn't it make sense to try to figure out what the best traders, investors, and business owners do or have done? And in addition, is it possible to insure against losses? It's going to be one of the key takeaways to this first lesson or this first part of the course is this idea of focusing on losses rather than gains. So the first person I want to look at is Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio has a net worth of roughly $17 billion, and he's the founder of the world's biggest hedge fund. It's called Bridgewater Associates, and it manages $140 billion. Then we move on to Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is worth over $70 billion, and he's known as the Oracle of Omaha. Warren Buffett is one of the most successful investors of all time. Jim Simons, $23.5 billion net worth. Jim Simons has the best track record of any hedge fund over a period of decades. He's the founder of Renaissance Technologies and an esteemed quantitative trading hedge fund firm. He manages about $80 billion. Then we have Paul Tudor Jones. He's a hedge fund manager and is known for his macro trades, particularly his bets on interest rates and currencies. So let's take a look at these gentlemen. These are people that I have studied for years and years. And so if we're trying to be better at making money, if we're trying to figure out 
how to do better for ourselves, how to control money. To me, it makes sense to look into what these gentlemen have accomplished and what they have to say about the investment world, being that they are all billionaires, and some of them are in the top 20 richest men in the entire world. All right. Terrell Owens said that if you align expectations with reality, you'll never be disappointed. So let's look at the actual track records of these individuals. Warren Buffett averaged about 17.1% through his company Berkshire Hathaway over the past 30 to 40 years. Jim Simons, as I mentioned, had the greatest track record or public track record of any hedge fund manager, uh, I think, in history. I've, I've never seen a record better than his. Comment down below if you have or know of a hedge fund manager who has a public audited record greater than 66%. Paul Tudor Jones. His record stands at 26%. That's his track record for annual investment returns or average annual investment returns. And then back to Ray Dalio at 3.8%. Now, Ray Dalio's average is a little bit higher than that. Depending on what fund you look at, we will look at a different fund of his later on. But his, his, his main fund has suffered uh, in the last five or six years, and the performance has gone down. But even at 3.8%, he's still worth $17 billion. And so this brings up a question. Is it reasonable to think that you can achieve results much greater than the richest, most successful investors in the world? And what would you think if I asked you that same question regarding sports? Would you think that when if you started playing basketball, would you set the bar at the ability of LeBron James or Michael Jordan? If you played golf, would you expect to be as good as Tiger Woods? All right, these are men who have dedicated their entire lives to these sports. And if you were to be as good at them as good as they are, how long do you think it would take you to get there? Again, if you align expectations with reality, you will never be disappointed. What about intelligence? Is it reasonable to think that you will surpass the most intelligent individuals in the entire world? All right. So right before us, we have the track records of the most successful hedge fund managers in existence. There are others among them. I just chose these four because I've read books about them and studied them um, for the past decade. But all of them will fall in this range. And, and as I mentioned, I'm, I made it a point to include Simons with his 66% annual return which, by the way, he charged over 50% fees on, so the investors never actually saw a 66% return. They saw something more along the lines of 20%. All right, so what can we learn from these people? Here's one thing that I believe can change your entire financial future, and it's the foundation for just about everything I believe. The richest people in the world look for and build networks. Everyone else looks for work. Robert Kiyosaki. Some years back, I read the book by Robert Kiyosaki called Cash Flow Quadrant. I would suggest you go get that book if you have not read that uh, and read Rich Dad, Poor Dad before you read Cash Flow Quadrant. But in that book, Kiyosaki outlines four ways to produce income. Linear income versus leveraged and residual income. So the first quadrant outlines an employee. If you are an employee, you have a job. There's not really any leverage in this position. All right. And roughly 95% of the population will fall into this quadrant. These people, even though 95% of them fall in this quadrant, only hold 5% of the wealth. What employees do is they trade their time, which is their most valuable asset for money. So let's think about that. In this quadrant, the individual is trading their most valuable asset for something that is not their most valuable asset. If employees want to make more money, they must trade more time. Promotions are one way to make more money in this quadrant, but the cycle will continue to play out. There is no leverage in this position. Then we move to the bottom left quadrant. This is an individual who's self-employed. If you're self-employed, you own a job. Again, there is no leverage in this position, and no leverage represents about 95% of the population. Not that 95% of the population are self-employed, but they have no leverage. 
In this quadrant, the amount of active work determines your income. And that's the same thing as the employee quadrant above. These are small business owners and independent contractors. They have high earning potential that they, sorry, they have a higher earning potential than the average employee. And in addition, they can take advantage of some tax breaks. People in this quadrant are still limited because they trade their time for money as they must be present in order for the business to operate. These people tend to work the longest hours and have the highest failure rates. Recently on the channel, I have talked about business ownership and starting a business. This confused many people as they thought I was referring to someone who is self-employed. I received many comments about, yes, uh, business starting a business has a very high failure rate and it's not as easy as you say. It's not as straightforward. Most of the discrepancy is coming from people thinking that everyone who owns a business is self-employed and owns a job. And that's simply not the case. And that's what I'm about to teach you here. Business owners fall into a, an, an entirely different quadrant. You see, what business owners do is they own a system. They do not own a job. They have ultimate leverage, and 95% of all wealth comes from this quadrant. And the reason is, is that income does not depend on active work. All right? People in this quadrant own a system that creates money. They do not own a job that requires their presence. What happens is employees work to fulfill and build the entrepreneur's dream. These businesses will continue to make money in the absence of the founder. So if you as an individual start one of these businesses and you create these systems, you can ultimately exit the business. You do not need to be present in order for it to generate wealth for you. And the business becomes an asset which can be bought or sold independent of you, the founder. This quadrant gets the most tax breaks and members no longer have to trade their time for money. So therefore, leverage is very abundant. Next, we have the investor category. People in this quadrant have money to invest. They do not have to trade their time for earnings. And in this quadrant, the members money works for them. These investments typically come in the form of stocks, commodities, real estate, other businesses, and on and on. There is leverage here and only 5% of the population falls into this category. The thing that I want to draw your attention to is that most wealthy people will fall on the right side of the cash flow quadrant. They will either be business owners or investors, and most often they will be both. It is very hard for anyone in the employee quadrant or the self-employed quadrant to keep up with individuals who are business owners that own systems and investors that own investments. So for the entirety of this course, I am not going to talk about how to be an employee or how to be a better employee. I am not going to talk about how to be self-employed and own a job. What I want to focus on is how to start a business, which, which is ultimately a system in which other people, you leverage other people, a team of people to create wealth. And I want to focus on the investor quadrant for today's video, just because this is a trading channel, I want to lead with the investor quadrant, but I want you to pay attention because later on in this video, I'm going to talk about some ideas uh, for when I cover the business owner quadrant. And I think some of those are really interesting. So you're, you'll want to stick around to see that, even though this video will probably be quite lengthy, I promise you it will be worth it. All right, so the investment quadrant, that's what we're going to cover today. Here's an overview. This is 80% psycho so, sorry. This is 80% psychology and 20% mechanics. And when I say mechanics, I mean how to. 100% of this has to do with managing risk, and you're going to hear me focus on that a whole lot today. Managed risk, managed risk. So let's talk about it. If you've never traded anything and this is your first time just being exposed to this, I'm going to start everything from a macro or high level and then get down into more detail. Some very, very important principles that I must cover in this video before I can move down into the specifics of technical analysis, timing markets, intraday trading, those types of things. The real wealth is created here, and I will explain that as I go on.
But just on the basis of being a trader, every person is actually a trader, rather you want to be or not. You don't really have a choice in this. Most people choose to trade their time for money. That's kind of the default. That's what we, we are taught to do. We're taught to go to college. We're taught to, or at least go to, to high school or possibly learn a trade or go to trade school. And what this does is it teaches us to be employees that trade our time, which no amount of money could ever buy, but we trade our time for money. And this is an awful trade. It's the worst kind of trade. You are trading the most valuable thing that you have for money that is not worth nearly what your time is worth. Then we have investors. Everyone is also an investor. If you have cash of any form, no matter what country you, you are living in, you are investing in that currency. So if we follow the old adages about saving money, every time you save money and put it into a bank, 100% of the money in your bank account is invested in a certain currency. The problem is, is that most currencies are fiat currencies, which means that inflation works against them. Have you ever noticed the price of goods going up during your lifetime? Have you ever noticed that buying a can of soda is more expensive now than when you were a small child? It's not because soda got more expensive. It's because the currencies have fallen in value, the U.S. dollars being one of the primary suspects. So we're investors, whether we want to be or not. So it's prudent for us to figure out how to diversify our risk, because if you have your money in a bank account, you are putting 100% of your faith in that currency. All right, learners. This is the big thing that differentiates the successful from the unsuccessful. There's a quote that I love that says, the learner shall inherit the earth while the learned will be beautifully equipped to live in a world that no longer exists. Another one is that they're the successful people constantly learn and grow and unsuccessful people believe that they already know. What most of the population has working against them is that they think that finance is too complicated. And because they don't want to put in the time, effort, and energy into learning this, they hand that responsibility off to another person. That person gets paid to handle the first person's money. See, when this happens, you're handing your money to a for-profit corporation. They make their money by charging fees on your money or selling you something. Their money is not tied to the outcome of your long-term or short-term investment. They're going to get paid no matter what. And the reason they're getting paid is because the investor has not taken the time to learn about finance and investing. And I'm here to tell you that it's not that complicated. You can absolutely learn this. So there's an 80-20 rule. I mentioned this earlier. It's 80% psychological and 20% how-to. So on the psychological aspect, we'll get into the how-to later, but first let's set some groundwork. There needs to be framework. There are some tenets or things that can be done that can really work in your favor when trying to ensure your success. All right, so here are a few questions that you need to answer before investing or trading. Can you pay yourself first? Can you pay yourself first? This is a very, very important principle. So unless you, unless you are planning on having a windfall of profits or inheriting a fortune, this is one of the things that will be most pivotal to your success. It's paying yourself first. Anyone under the sound of my voice that wants to be successful in investing needs to get into the habit of paying yourself before you pay anyone or anything else. Most people get their paycheck and they go spend it on items. Maybe they're buying food, you're paying for rent, you're paying for your car, your car insurance, clothes. And what's happening is your money is going to everyone but you. And you are the one that worked for that money. If you own a business, you are the one that created the system that produced that money. And if you're getting your money from assets, you're the one that worked to create those assets. So why are you not paying yourself first? If you don't pay yourself first, then there's no way for you to ever build that nest egg that you'll need to invest or trade in the future. This is called investing in yourself. This is investing in you, but not the present you. This is investing in the future version of you. So you have to do what you need to do in order to automate this process. Making this as simple as possible is pivotal, 
pivotal to your success. So once you can get in that habit, you will start to accumulate funds. And when you accumulate that money, you can use that money to invest. So don't just go buy an Apple phone, own Apple stock, right? Don't just drink Starbucks coffee. You can buy the company. Don't complain when you have to sit in traffic around Christmas time. Buy the retailer that's causing the traffic and don't sit idly by and watch Jeff Bezos become the richest man in the world. A couple of days ago that switched and now it's Elon Musk. But you can, you can invest in Amazon. You can invest in Tesla, but you cannot do it if you don't have the capital. And one of the simplest ways to, to make sure that you have that capital is to invest in yourself first. All right. Are you looking for short-term income or long-term financial freedom and eventually wealth or both? It's very hard to prioritize short-term income and actually achieve long-term financial freedom. It's, it's very, very difficult. I'll get into more of that later on in this video. Another question that you must answer. Do you believe that there is a higher chance of creating wealth through short-term market timing or intelligent long-term holds with proper asset allocation and rebalancing? Some of you may not even understand what that means. Uh, if you don't, let me break it down in this way. Do you believe that you have a greater chance at timing a security, such as a currency, um, a futures contract, a stock, at timing when it will go up and appreciate in value, and doing that with enough consistency to create wealth, or do you believe that long-term holds with proper allocation of your funds, reducing risk, is the better answer? We're going to talk more about that in the coming slides. And the, and the fourth question that you need to answer, are you committed to finding a repeatable process for long-term wealth creation? Because if you are not, well, then I'm not sure exactly what you're planning on doing to create wealth. So we need to find a system, some kind of process, something that's repeatable, something that allows us to take action towards our end goals. He who lives by the crystal ball will eat shattered glass. Ray Dalio. All right, so here's a concept for you. Short-term trading. Short-term trading is done for short-term income. I touched on that in the previous slide. This uses predefined risk and reward zones should only be done with money that you are willing to lose 100% of as any number of factors can lead to a loss. If you, go, if you are going to do short-term trading, you need to trade with insurance. This is a new concept. This is something that you are going to learn about in this video, and I think it will greatly, greatly impact your trading. So when short-term trading, it's just a, just, just a thought, but what if you took 20% of your trading funds and invested in your short-term trading model and took the other 80% and invested that money. Actually invested that money in something that had much more limited downside risk. I'll show you the math behind this, and in my opinion, it's absolutely brilliant. Then you have long-term investing. This is done with money that you never want to lose. You cannot gamble with this money. This is your nest egg. Most of your available funds should go here. This is funded by income producing assets such as businesses or real estate, and it leverages the most powerful money making principle that exists. And I will cover that in the next slide. So you're going to want to see this. Stay tuned. But in the, in the coming slides, I'm not only going to talk about how to ensure your trading capital against losses, but I'm also going to talk about how to make tons of money leveraging the single most powerful money making principle that exists. All right, so what is it? What is the most powerful money-making principle of all time? Well, Albert Einstein said that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world, and he who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. Buffett says that my wealth has come from a combination of living in America, some lucky genes, and compound interest. Jeff Rich says that compound interest is proof of God's existence, and John Bogle which is the founder of Vanguard and the creator of index funds, says that owning the stock market over the long term is a winner's game, but attempting to beat the market is a loser's game. So those are some pretty reputable sources. Again, John Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, 
The miracle of compounding returns is overwhelmed by the tyranny of compounding costs. So by now we understand that compounding returns is the preferred method for the richest, most successful people in the world. But if there is one enemy to compounded returns, it's compounding costs. So I want to show you this just in the event that you've never seen this. This is the magic of compounding. What you have on the far left are years. It's year 1 through 25. I made up a round number for $10,000 starting balance. Don't worry if you don't have $10,000. But just for, for math, I started with $10,000. I assumed a yearly return of 12%. That would be 1% a month. 12%. And what I did is I added 3% of the starting balance monthly. So I assumed that each month I would place 3% of the starting balance into the account. If you look in the column that says adding 3% of starting balance monthly, you'll see it appreciates to the amount of $23,110, which is roughly $2,000 per month. I know it's a little bit less, but once I reached $2,000 contribution per month, I kept it from year six all the way to year 25. If you're under the sound of my voice and contributing $2,000 to an investment account seems totally out of your reach, it's not. It's not. You, you can absolutely do it in time. Notice you're only hitting that area at year six. But if you put the tenets in place to actually build money uh, to try to create wealth through business ownership or, or a myriad of other venues, you can absolutely have a surplus of that much money per month. And if you were to do that, if you start in year one with $10,000, assuming no expenses and no taxes, that money, without you touching it, at 12% per year, will grow to $2,350,153 by year 25. But let's talk about something more impactful in the short term. If you start with $10,000 on year one, at the end of year five, you'll have $71,000. If you start with $10,000 on year one, by the year, by the end of the 10th year, you'll have $271,000, almost $272,000. So the point here is this simple habit of putting your money in a long-term investment that compounds can take a $10,000 investment today and turn it into a house 10 years from now. It's an interesting concept. All right, so I want you to just pay attention to these ending balances and how they grow. And notice the magic of compounding. At first, it's a little slow. You move from 14,000 to 21 to 32 to 47. But when you really start going along, you'll move from a million dollars to a million two fifty to a million four, a million six, a million eight, two million. You see, it starts to happen very quickly. And if you look at the yearly return of 12% column, you'll see that that 12% by year 20 starts generating, well, actually by year 18, it's generating six figures a year without you lifting a single finger. And that all comes from investing $10,000. Now I want you to imagine how many of you plan on living another 10 years. If you do, there's an opportunity, an opportunity for you with very little risk to actually grow $10,000 into an amount such as 271,000. Now I don't have the crystal ball, right? I don't know what will happen in the future. I cannot guarantee any type of investment returns, but there are many portfolios that have returned 10 to 12% historically and really for decades. The problem is that people scoff at that 10 to 12% because they're looking for instant wealth. They're looking for instant gratification. Well, I want you to stop and pause for just a minute and think about any other area of your life. And now think about instant gratification in that area. Instant gratification always leads to pain. Instant gratification is not good. If you live in an area of instant gratification, you will never be able to achieve success at anything. Instant gratification is the enemy of success. I've heard it said that a true, a, a, a true descriptor, a true indication of maturity is the ability to delay pleasure. You find people who are successful, you'll find people who have the ability to delay pleasure. But I want to point out that the $10,000 turns into $2.35 million over 25 years. Now let's talk about what happens when you add taxes. If you were to trade, let's say short term, right? And you achieve the same return with short term trading. Well then in the United States, you would owe what's called short term capital gains. 
which is the exact same as ordinary income. I included that tax here at 33%. For someone like myself, that rate is actually going to be a good bit higher than that, and for others, that rate may be lower. But if you take the taxes column, right, and you total that number up, the total amount of taxes you will pay is, over the course of 25 years is 421,335.62. Many people assume that the difference in this previous model I showed you that went to $2.35 million should be 2.35 minus the amount you pay in taxes, which is 421000 So people might think, oh, well, the total amount left will be $1.9 million. That's not the case because of how compounding works. The difference in results between paying taxes yearly and not paying taxes yearly after 25 years is $1,484,000. Now look at the quote on the right-hand side of the screen. The miracle of compounding returns is overwhelmed by the tyranny of compounding costs. What I did not include in this is slippage. Slippage is when you actually go to buy something and you're not able to be filled at that price. Or your broker is displaying a price that is not an accurate price, which means that you overpay when you buy and you don't get the full amount when you sell. There are large, large lawsuits going on right now with these commission-free brokers because they do that very thing. And a lot of brokers actually make a ton of money on slippage through market orders. But you have slippage, and then you have commissions that are charged by some platforms, and other fees such as platform fees or charting fees. All of those things, all of those things, drastically reduce your returns when you look at how compounding works. There's a quote that I love here from Anthony Robbins in his book, Unshakable. He said, here's another way to put this in perspective. An actively managed fund that charges you 3%, this would be a mutual fund, a year is 60 times more expensive than an index fund that charges you 0.05%. Imagine going to Starbucks with a friend. She orders a venti cafe latte and pays $4.15, but you decide that you're happy to pay 60 times more. Your price is $249. I'm guessing you'd think twice before doing that. Now, I can hear now people saying, well, the mutual fund doesn't have a fee of 3%. My mutual funds have a fee of 1% or 1.5%. Read your prospectus. There are hidden fees associated with many, many mutual funds. And maybe you have a, a low a low fee fund. But many studies have found that when studying mutual funds broadly, the average load is more like 3.5%, even though the advertised rate is somewhere around 1%. Uh, regardless, index funds charge you significantly less, and that can radically change your results over years and years. All right. Buffett says, Wall Street makes its money on activity. You make your money on inactivity. What does that mean? That means don't trade frequently with the vast amount of your money. That is how brokers, people who sell courses, that is how Wall Street people who fulfill orders, investment banks, consultants, investment advisors, they make their money on activity. You make your money on inactivity. Jim Rogers says, do not buy the hype from Wall Street and the press that stocks always go up. For many people, they'll look at the past 10 years and just assume that the stock market always goes up because we've been in a bull market. There are long periods when stocks do nothing and other investments are better. Warren Buffett also says, diversification, diversification is a protection against ignorance. It makes very little sense to those who know what they are doing. In other words, if you know exactly what the markets are going to do tomorrow, diversification doesn't help you. But if you don't know what's going to happen, it can protect you. And then I have an excerpt from Ecclesiastes. To, every, to everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to plant, and a time to harvest that which is planted, a time to break down, and a time to build up. That brings me to my next slide. In my next slide, I talk about how it is not intelligent to just buy the hot stock or the hot currency. If you make a mistake with your largest nest egg, you can lose everything. You cannot afford to take too many risks here. Think about how hard you work for your money. 
Think about what you've had to put in to set aside the, um, the, the, the capital that you have to trade or the capital that you have to invest. Can you afford to lose it? We've all heard of people who have lost everything in the markets, people who lost half their money in a downturn. They're not able to retire. They're not able to live the way that they want. Here's a good example. This is a chart of U.S. national home prices. Anyone can look at this and see that U.S. home prices have appreciated for decades. However, it doesn't mean that buying it any place will end up working out well for you in the short term. Take a look at this arrow. Imagine you were to purchase right here. You bought your first home, as many did, right in 2007. For the next decade, you're trying to get that equity back to where you were in 2007. Yes, home prices have now appreciated past this point, and there's more to the right side of this chart. And anyone who bought in 2007, I shouldn't say anyone, some people are still underwater, but many people who bought in 2007, had they held their house for, for 13 years, they may have some equity in that house. Now, they may have some profit. However, they would have had to take a 30 to 40% loss over the course of three to four years if they purchased in this place. Had they not just purchased a house, but also purchased gold at the exact same time, which is where this arrow is, I want you to take a look at the appreciation of gold. The appreciation of gold is more than enough to offset the losses in the real estate market had someone been prudent enough to split their portfolio between gold and owning a home. So my question is, can you predict the future? Can you? Because if you can, none of this is necessary. But if you don't know what's coming next, you may want to pay attention to what else I have to say here. Speculation leads you the wrong way. It allows you to put your emotions first, whereas investments gets emotions out of the picture. John Bogle, founder of Vanguard, creator of index funds. So there's really only three ways to increase your returns from investment. The first way is a better choice of security. This is very difficult to do, and most investors get this wrong. An example would be fundamental analysis. When you're taking a look at the financial stability of a company before you buy it, uh, when you're looking at track records and guidance, all in an effort to make a better choice of buying a security that will appreciate in value. Not many people are very good at that. Number two, better timing of purchases. This is also very hard to do, possibly harder to do than number one. Most traders will fail trying this method. An example would be technical analysis and timing the markets. Number three is better asset allocation. This is actually very easy to do. This is about creating a group of balanced investments that complement each other through the four market cycles. I'm going to talk further about market cycles later on in this presentation. I'm also going to talk about the four seasons of the market. The goal is to balance risk for any uncertain future outcome. Every one of the greatest investors in history agree on this, or at least everyone that I've seen personally. We can use this as trading insurance. Again, if you've stuck with me this long, you do not want to leave until I talk to you about trading insurance, what that means, and how it can protect you with your downside risk whenever you're trading. All right. Warren Buffett says, never test the depths of the river with both feet. So if we have the choice between these three, a better choice of security, better timing of purchases, or better asset allocation, the fastest and easiest thing to implement that will have the greatest impact long term will be number three, better asset allocation. And if you have no idea what I mean when I say that, stay tuned. There's more to come. So before I get into that, I want to highlight this one particular individual because he is where the idea for this asset allocation came from. So I don't want you to be 
uh, tainted by his return earlier. I mentioned that he had a 3.8% return. That's just the public record of one of his funds. He has several funds and he has a certain asset allocation that he designed uh, for the management of his personal estate, which is one of the things that we're going to build off of in this video. And it has returned significantly more than 3.8%. But Ray Dalio is the 29th richest person, I believe, in the world. It might be in the United States, but I think it's the world. And he's worth $16.9 billion as of January 2021. He manages, or his firm, Bridgewater Associates, um, another thing to pay attention to, every one of these individuals that are worth so much money are worth that money through the ownership of their companies. So even though they have the skill of being able to grow money, they still incorporate themselves and leverage a company to make their net worth substantially greater than it would be had they just invested their own money. All right, so he manages $140 billion, and he's given more than $850 million, million to uh, philanthropic causes. So he donates his money, and a lot of it, and, and, it's, and I'm grateful for that because he's had a significant impact on the way that I view investing. He also has a book, if you're interested in reading a book uh, by Ray Dalio, it's a book called Principles, and it's just incredible. It has, it's not going to show you a specific investment technique, but it has everything to do with um, his mindset, his psychology, and the psychology behind building Bridgewater Associates, which is how he made all of his money. Thank you for making it this far in the video. Uh, I know this is a lot of information to take in, and I thought this would be a good time to just kind of insert this here. There is a reason to the madness behind this video, and I have to start and get into some, some pretty detailed information before I can get to uh, the, the ultimate thing that I'm wanting to get across to you. So I need to break out asset allocation, I need to break out and prove to you what the track record looks like for these sorts of things because I'm going to build upon this later in the video. I want to share something with you uh, personal. When I first got started trading and many, many traders that I have worked alongside or talked to and heard their stories did this very similar thing. What I did was I took all the money I could gather up because I needed to be wealthy and I needed to be wealthy quick. I wanted to change my life circumstances and I wanted to do that in the shortest time possible. There's this thing called confirmation bias and what it can do is it makes you see things that align with the beliefs that you want and you end up missing small details that contradict what you ultimately want to happen. It's one of the reasons that trading scams are so prevalent and that trading gurus and trading instructors are literally everywhere on the internet. Because what, what these people are able to do is they're able to convince other people that this is easy, this is very straightforward, and you can do it in a very small period of time. They then have math that backs that up. And the math works if the assumption of the return actually works. The problem is, is the return isn't accurate. So they're using a return that's not proven. And if it is proven, it's proven over a very, very short period of time. And that's why I wanted to cover this idea of seasonality. Even if you have a trading strategy, as I have had, I have had trading strategies in which I have quadrupled my account in a single month using an option strategy. And what happens is you become convinced that that is the, the, the holy grail, the magic pill. And because you want it so bad, you want it with all of your being, you'll actually put more money into that. And even trading strategies, no matter how good they are, they all have a seasonality, just like we talked about how sometimes stocks go up, sometimes bonds go up, sometimes uh, the treasuries go up, sometimes you have different commodities that move in, at different times and you have real estate and they may all move at different times. Trading strategies are very much like that too. They have a shelf life and they will only hold their edge for so long. If you find something that has a statistical edge, you can bet that there are many, many other people that are looking at that as well. So the mistake I made was I took all of my money, at the time it was $2,500, and I dumped it into an account. Well, what I did then is rather than trading a small piece of that money to prove the concept, I didn't want to waste any time. So I traded with all of the money. And when I had drawdowns, 
um, it was nearly impossible for me to come back from. So just think about this. Imagine you have a thousand dollar account, right? And you lose 50% of that account. It's very easy to happen, especially if you're trading something that's leveraged like Forex or options or really uh, penny stocks is another one that's that they're very volatile. So it's this promise of these high returns, but you also are taking high risks. There is a reason. In hindsight, it is very, very clear to me, but when I started, I could not see it. There is a reason why people like Warren Buffett say that they focus on risk more than anything else. Risk, risk, risk. Because if you take a $1,000 account and you lose 50% of that money, a 50% return in the positive direction does not get you back to even. It now takes a 100% return. So let's do the math. $1,000, you lose 50%, your account is now $500. Just to get back to where you started, just to get back to where you started, you now have to double your account. And that just gets you back even. And that takes the most important thing that you have to do that, time. You have to put time into doing that. And that's assuming you have a strategy that can literally double your money, right? So it's very, very, very difficult to do this, but it's very easy to fall into that trap of believing that you are right on the edge. And that's the, th that's the thing that keeps traders in the market is thinking they're right on the edge of finding this thing that's gonna make them wealthy, right on the edge of this magical indicator, right on the edge of finding a piece of information that works. And what is more logical is to just look at the people who have had the success, and not just the people who say they have had the success, but the people who can prove it, right? You don't pay attention to what people say, pay attention to what people do and what they can prove. And so the next part of this video is just an effort to prove some of the track records of some of the asset allocation. And what I'm going to talk about later in the video is what you can actually do with that alongside your trading to ensure that if even if things don't play out the way that you anticipate, you're still okay. Even if things don't play out the way that you hope, that you dream, um, you're still okay and don't lose your money in the process. You can learn these lessons at a much lower cost than I did. Because I kept that hope, I continued to fund my account and I would lose money over and over again. Eventually, I started losing that money slower and then eventually I was able to trade for a period of time without losing any money. And to me, that was a success. But think about the returns I would have to have to recoup all of the money that I lost while learning. And had I just taken a sophisticated, informed approach to this from the start, which is what I am giving to you, it would have worked out so much better for me. It would have, man, it would have just been wonderful for me, but I didn't want to give up that dream. I didn't want to give up that hope. I had felt like I had been invited into this trading community, this investment community. Um, I was able to talk about technical analysis and talk about different yields and things like that. And it made me feel like I was a part of something special, like this niche group um, that understood how to pull money out of the markets. And I was always just on the edge of getting wealthy. If anything I'm saying resonates with you, please pay attention, okay? You're not alone. This is a normal progression. This is, this is how this happens, all right? I, I'm trying to convey that I started just like you. I started exactly like you, saying I need to grow money in trading. And I fell victim to a mindset that was inaccurate and ultimately led to me losing a lot of money. And it took a lot of effort and energy to recoup that money and get to where I am today. And without that hurdle, Without that hurdle, of course, I, I learned things from it, and it has, it has led me to where I am today, but without that hurdle, uh, where I would sit financially right now in this present moment would be much, much, much greater than it actually is today. I'm in a great spot. I would be in an even better spot had I just had the information that I'm about to share with you. So please just keep that in mind. I thought I'd drop this little note just to share that personal experience that I've had. 
So one of the things uh, that's very commonplace when creating a portfolio or an investment portfolio or figuring out how you're going to put your money to work is this idea of a balanced portfolio. And this is traditionally something that you would hear from money managers or advisors, but a lot of people will split their portfolio between stocks and bonds. So they'll put half of their money in stocks, half of their money in bonds. And some professional advisors recommend 60, 40, or even 70, 30, 70% stocks, 30% bonds, or the inverse, depending on your risk tolerance. But if you're younger and you're willing to take more risk, they may recommend a 60, 40, 70, 30. And the prevailing thought is that this model will balance out risk by limiting an investor's exposure to the market because you're only 50% exposed exposed to the stock market and 50% exposed to the bond market. But in 2008, this model showed losses of 25 to 40%. And one of the things that Dalio says about this is because he says this happened because stocks are historically three times more volatile than bonds. So when stocks fell in 2008, so did the whole portfolio. I want to pause just for a second, just for the newcomers and, and just talk about what stocks and bonds are. Just very quickly, a stock is a type of investment that represents ownership in a company. When you purchase a company stock, you are purchasing a very small piece of that company. Money is made when the company's value goes up over time. See, when the value of the company goes up, you own a small piece of that company. The value of that piece of company will go up as well. That's how you make money in stocks. Bonds are different than stocks. Bonds are are really in its simplest form, they're loans. Bonds are loans. So when you buy a bond, you are making a loan to a company, a government, or some other entity. And when you lend money to the government, it's called a treasury bond. Many of you may have heard of treasury yields, um, or someone will talk about treasury notes. All right, that's what they're referring to. When you lend money to a business, it's called a corporate bond. And when you loan money to a less than dependable company, a company that may be in trouble financially uh, or maybe doesn't have the best track record, it's called a junk bond. And that's it. Those, those are bonds. That's what you need to know for now. But here's a chart that represents that 50-50 split. So if you, as you can see here, traditional thought is 50% bonds, 50% stocks. But this is not balanced risk. And earlier I mentioned very specifically you want to balance risk. Because of the volatility of stocks relative to bonds, the actual risk of a 50-50 portfolio is 95% of that risk is coming from stocks and only 5% is coming from bonds. So what this portfolio structure has a very good chance of doing is doing well in good times and bad in bad times. So if the stock market is going up, 95% of the risk is coming from stocks. And so therefore what's going to happen is this portfolio is going to go up. And if stocks go down, well, there's not enough bond exposure to stop the portfolio from falling. When looking back through history, there's one thing that we can see with absolute certainty. Every investment has an ideal environment in which it flourishes. In other words, there is a season for everything. Let's talk really quickly about the four things that move the price of assets. Number one, inflation. Number two, deflation. Number three, rising economic growth. Number four, declining economic growth. If you do not know what inflation or deflation, if you don't know what either of those terms mean, then pause the video and Google it very quickly. I'm not going to take the time to dive into inflation, even though I may later in this course. But those are the four things that move the price of assets. And that's that's really it. Those things move the price of various assets. And different assets respond to those things in different ways. So when one asset goes up, another asset may be going down and vice versa. And it has everything to do with how they respond to the, those four things. All right. So. Since there are only four different environments, we'll call those seasons, and that will affect how investments go up or down, and these can happen in any order. So the four seasons are higher than, it's higher than expected inflation, this is rising prices, and you know rising prices quickly. Number two is lower than expected inflation, deflation, 
Number three is higher than expected economic growth. And number four is lower than expected economic growth. If you pay attention, um, the Federal Reserve and, and, and various committees will meet in the United States as in other countries. And periodically, people receive reports on the economic growth of a country. And they look at GDP numbers. They look at a, a number of different aspects. But higher than expected economic growth causes certain assets to respond better than others, whereas lower than expected economic growth causes other assets to respond because people will take their money out of one and put them in another. So this is a quick chart just that shows those four seasons that move the price of assets. And you have rising growth, rising inflation, falling growth, falling inflation, lower than expected inflation. So everything that I've already outlined right here in this chart, just as a, a quick visual. Due to the four seasons or economic environments, Dalio says that you should allocate 25% of your risk, 25% of your risk in each of the four categories. This is known as the all weather approach due to there being four possible seasons financially and the fact that no one knows what season will come next. So diversifying your risk in this way keeps you safe in the various market environments. And thus this is called the all weather approach. And so this four quadrant approach allows the investors to be covered all the time. And here's a chart that just shows what performs and when and under what circumstance. And so we have stocks, corporate bonds, commodities, gold, inflation linked bonds, treasury bonds, and treasury bonds in stocks again in the, in the bottom right quadrant. And then finally, here's the breakout of that allocation based on risk. And so the best, the best allocation that Dalio was able to find is a portfolio that is 30% stocks, 40% long-term U.S. bonds, intermediate U.S. bonds at 15%, and then 7.5% gold and 7.5% commodities. I've seen people split 7.5% and do say uh, 3.75, I think is what it ends up being, or sometimes they'll do say three and a half and four, and they'll actually add utilities under commodities. But I just, just it bears repeating a portfolio of 30% stocks, 40% long-term U.S. bonds, 15% intermediate U.S. bonds, 7.5% gold, 7.5% commodities. And that's how you can diversify your risk amongst the four categories or four seasons. If a lot of what I said didn't make sense to you, the following slides will help clarify, hopefully. So what are the returns? What do they look like? So we're going to look at annual returns. All right. So at the top, you have a portfolio. That's the all weather portfolio. That's the allocation that I just showed you. And then that is being compared to the S and P 500. So when we see the initial balance of $10,000, that starts at the beginning of 2007 and it goes all the way through the beginning of 2020. When we compare the two portfolios, we see that the S and P 500 had a final balance of 29,000, where the all weather had a final balance of, of 25,000. So it was 29,000 for S and P, 25,000 for all weather portfolio. All right. So the CAGR stands for compounded annual growth rate and all weather is at 7.42%. So that's about what it returned per, per year. And the S and P 500 had a compounded annual growth rate of 8.71, which is higher than the all-weather portfolio. So, so far the S&P 500 seems like a better choice than the all-weather portfolio. But now is where we get into important details, the standard deviation. So the standard deviation of the all-weather portfolio is 7.34% and the S&P 500 is 14.5%. It's double. And that has to do with the volatility. So I want you to think about owning a portfolio and you have money in this account that you cannot lose and or that you would be very unhappy losing. This is your nest egg. This is what you saved your whole life thus far for, and you have to figure out how to try to grow that money. 
Would you like that money to be volatile with upswings and big downswings? Or would you like it to be less volatile with little small upswings and small downswings so that when you check your account value, it's not either way up or way down, it's just steadily growing. So that's what we're looking at here with that standard deviation. The best year ever for the all weather portfolio is 18% and the S&P 500 is 32. That's significant. But look at this next piece. The worst year is 3.25% for the all weather portfolio. And it is 10 times that at 36.81%. So the big thing I want you to see is on the bottom left side of this chart, you can see 2008 and the financial crisis. This is where you're going to see that 36.81% drawdown on the S&P 500. For people who own the all-weather portfolio, it did what it was designed to do. It balanced the risk so that there wasn't a sharp decline. And so it only had a 3.25% loss that year and stayed relatively flat. For many people, they lost a lot of money in 2008 because they sold at the bottom because of how fearful they were. It's easy to see that there's a bottom now, but during 2008, that decline, when anyone was in the middle of it, or even towards the end of it, as long as it was still declining, a lot of people were wondering how far this can go. There was a lot of negative media, a lot of negative news, and a lot of fear. And so people had already lost you know, from peak to trough. You can see at the next the next column says max drawdown. That's looking at peak to trough. It's not looking at any calendar year. It's just looking at how far the drawdown was from the highest point to the lowest point during this series of information. And you can see a 50% decline in the S&P 500. So many people saw their life savings fall by 50% and they got scared and they sold because there's a certain number there's a certain number uh, for each of us that we're willing to see our life savings go down before we move it into cash or somewhere safe. And so for some people, it was 20 percent. They sold at some people. It was 30, but it went all the way down 50, 50 percent as a max drawdown. So my point is, is for the people who sold there, they weren't able to participate in the recovery, so they never made their money back. For people who did not sell, there was a recovery that got them back even over the next several years, and then they eventually moved on to continue to profit, and 2016 through 2020 have been some of the best years um, in history for the stock market. So my point is, is what if you didn't have to see a 50% drawdown? For people who have the all-weather portfolio, they only saw a 12% drawdown. Would it be easier to stay with your investments with a 12% drawdown or a 50% drawdown. And see, that's the big appeal to the all weather portfolio is it gets similar returns to the S and P 500, but the drawdowns are not nearly as significant. Uh, two more columns. I'm not going to harp on these forever, but there's the sharp ratio and the Sortino race ratio. And essentially what those are, those are different measures of risk adjusted return, because just looking at a return doesn't tell the whole story. You need to factor in risk, right? So I, I may have purchased something that appreciated 30% in a year, but what you don't know is that at one point it was down 30%. So in order to get to the 30% profit, you would have had to held through, you would have had to have held that security through a big loss first. So it's not the whole story. To get the whole story, you have to take into account standard deviation of the portfolio, how much it went up and how much it went down from a mean. And you want to figure out essentially what the actual return is risk adjusted. And so the, and so the highest, the higher, the sharp ratio, the better as far as your risk goes, essentially, it means it's a, it's, it's a much less volatile type of investment and it has a higher risk adjusted return. So the sharp ratio is, is a very good measure, but the sharp ratio measures volatility both up and down. The Sortino looks at it and says, okay, the only thing that's really a risk to the investor is volatility to the downside because volatility to the upside is actually a good thing. So many people think the Sortino ratio is actually more accurate than the sharp ratio. 
but just like the sharp ratio, a higher number is better. So when comparing the S&P 500 to the all weather portfolio, you'll see a 0.84 versus 1.41. And then lastly, we have U.S. market correlation. It makes sense that the S&P 500 is the U.S. market. So the correlation is one, but the all weather portfolio is only 0.4. So this is just a good graphic to show that you can achieve a very similar result to buying the market, which is actually one of Warren Buffett's recommendations is to just buy and hold the S and P 500. Uh, but not only could you get a similar return to holding the S and P 500, but you can do it with substantially less risk. And so that's good news. And I have even more good news to come. So here, the only thing that's different on this information is we're actually looking at the year 2020. So um, everyone listening to this, I'm sure, remembers what happened in February of 2020 when, when the global pandemic broke out. The stock market fell significantly, and you can see that on the red line, the S&P 500 on the right side of this chart. You can see that very sharp decline and then a very sharp recovery, that V bottom, right? Well, look at the blue line. So, yeah, the blue line is not making as much money as the red line. We already established that. The red line is the market. The blue line is the all-weather portfolio. But imagine having to withstand that type of decrease in your account and not selling. It would be a very hard thing to do because that happened in a matter of days, days and weeks, really. Um, it, it fell that sharp. So many people sold and they didn't they did not participate in that very sharp recovery and they've had to take that loss if you're the blue line you just stay steady and true i mean that's that's essentially what it is and so um can we leverage that to make any more money well you can actually because one way that you can get this allocation is to buy what are known as exchange traded funds. So an exchange traded fund is a leverage ex exchange. Sorry, We're, I'm looking at 2x leveraged exchange traded funds. But let's just talk about exchange traded funds in the in, in the first place. Um, exchange traded funds are very similar to mutual funds in that they are a collection of securities within typically a certain sector um, so if you have say a mutual fund that is a tech mutual fund and it invests in large tech companies such as amazon facebook amazon sorry uh, apple netflix google uh, you, you just you could just keep going. It would it would it would invest in hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of tech companies. Um, an ETF is very similar to that, but uh, you can actually buy and sell it on an exchange like the open market in the U.S. And so there are ticker symbols. There are actually um, funds that buy every single every single aspect of the S&P 500. So they'll buy all 500 stocks that are in the S&P 500, just like the actual index. Then they market that up and they, they buy those stocks in the exact right and correct proportions to match the S&P 500. And then you can actually buy a piece of that fund and invest in that fund, just like a stock. The only difference is it's not affected um, on a specific basis like a stock. So if, Apple is one of the holdings and it has bad news, the ETF will fall significantly less than the actual security itself like Apple. So there's much less risk because there's much less exposure to any one security. And it was actually John Bogle who, you know, popularized that through his Vanguard funds years and years ago. And he's been quoted in this video several times. So you can actually buy an ETF that reflects the long-term treasury yield or long-term treasury bond and the intermediate treasury bond and oil and gas sectors and gold and the S&P 500. So you can actually create the all-weather portfolio with an exchange traded fund. All you have to do is know the tickers and the right percentages to buy for the amount of money that you have to invest. And if you did that, your return would be very similar to what I've already shown with that blue line in the previous slides. But if you wanted to increase that return, you could use two times leveraged ETFs to create a two times leveraged all-weather portfolio.
And so what is a leveraged ETF? A leveraged exchange traded fund is a marketable security that uses financial derivatives and debt to amplify the returns of an underlying index. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, while a traditional exchange traded fund typically tracks the securities in its underlying index on a one to one basis, a leveraged ETF will aim for two to one or three to one. In this example, I'm showing two to one. So leveraged ETFs are available for most indexes. And what you can see is on the left, I actually have the tickers for the very specific indexes that are two times leveraged. So I have ticker symbol SSO, ticker symbol UBT, ticker symbol UST, DIG, and UGL, as well as the percentages um, that they need to be represented each in the actual portfolio and then a brief descriptor of what they are. So I have everything covered there with the two times leveraged all weather portfolio. So that's what we're looking at. So if you wanted to create a two times leveraged all weather portfolio, you just need to go buy those in the right proportions and you would do that. And you can do that on any brokerage platform. All right. So here's a chart that compares the all weather. This time the all weather is in red. Okay. That's the normal all weather fund that we looked at previously. Then a portfolio of 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Then the Vanguard 500 index investor, which is essentially the S&P 500 that we've been looking at. And one thing that has been added is at the very top, the blue line this time is the all weather two times leveraged portfolio. So just look at the chart. Previously, when I was showing you the all weather, I was showing you the red line on the lower chart. Now I want you to take a look at the blue line. The blue line is going to show about two times the returns. All right. But it also has about two times the risk. So let's take a look at it. We're going to compare the top line, which is the all weather two times. It's the blue uh, portfolio one. We're going to compare that with the Vanguard 500 index investor. It's the green line on the chart. And, and that's essentially the S&P 500. So I want to make a comparison similar to what we did earlier. So you can see that the financial balance has grown since 2007 from 10 grand to 55 grand with the two times leveraged all weather portfolio. And the S&P 500 has gone from 10 grand to 27. We now have a compounding annual growth rate of 13.88% for the all weather 2X. The standard deviation is 14.68%. So we have a standard deviation that almost um, is identical to the S&P 500, right? But what we've done now is we've, we've ratcheted up the volatility to match the S&P 500. So the ups and the downs while we hold our portfolio, the fluctuations of price, we've essentially doubled that. But all it does now is matches the S&P 500, even though it's doubled. But the return is significantly greater than the S&P 500 now because the S&P 500 here, it says 7.86. The one we looked at earlier was more like 8.4% but we're sitting at 13.88. So what we did was we just added at least another five and a half percent to our annual returns. The best year now with this all weather two times leveraged is 34.73%. And, and still, this is just fantastic. So even though you're getting the, those types of returns, those types of increases in the portfolio, look at the worst years. So even when we look at 2008, again, look at the chart and compare the blue line to the green line. The green line is what everyone else experienced, and the blue line is the two times leveraged all-weather portfolio. So the worst year was only 7.5% for the all-weather two, le two times leveraged, while the worst year of the S&P 500 is still over 37%, which is, I mean, it's five, five times, five times worse. Um, yeah, and then the max drawdown from peak to trough, because remember the moves don't happen from January to December 31st, a down move can happen anytime. So you want to measure from the peak of the portfolio's performance to the largest drawdown from that peak. And with the SP 500, that's over 50%. And even, even though we have leveraged, um, even though we have leveraged the ETFs by two times the worst year, is still only seven and a half percent with a max drawdown of 24 percent which is half of the s p 500 so it makes sense that when you take a look at the sharp ratios s p's at 
0.53 or the Vanguard 500, I should say. And the all weather two times portfolio is still at 0.9 for the sharp ratio. So it's, that's really great. All right. So here we are using the all weather two times portfolio as trading insurance. What is trading insurance? Well, it's just kind of something I made up, but I think you'll like it. First, I want to just talk about insurance. Um, this is talking about an actual insurance policy, which is not what I am implying in any way, shape or form. But I am just talking from the perspective that insurance um, is a form of financial protection or reimbursement against losses. That's why I'm using the word insurance. I don't mean insurance as far as how it's traditionally represented, like an insurance policy that's bought or sold. What I'm saying is a way to structure your investments so that you have financial protection. All right. Insurance policies are used to hedge against the risk of financial losses, both big and small. So my my thing is, can we use this all weather two times portfolio as a way to hedge against losses that we may incur on our short term trading um, funds, let's let's say or, or monies? So can we take a part of our portfolio and trade it? trying to time the market or, uh, you know, do intraday trading, swing trading, uh, multiple securities. Can we, can we use part of our portfolio for that and then use the rest, um, in a more conservative manner to actually cover our butts if the trading performance doesn't pan out the way that we intended, especially while we're learning? Uh, first step, determine how much money you can use to trade and invest. Second step, Use math to determine how to properly allocate 80% of your funds into the all weather or all weather two times and leave 20% of your funds to trade. Okay. So what I'm saying is if you have a $10,000 account, why not learn how to trade with your, with $2,000? If you have a $1,000 account, why don't you learn to trade with $200? If it doesn't work with $200, it's not going to work with $2,000. So it doesn't require a whole lot of money to learn if you have a good trading strategy or not. So what I am saying is rather than putting 80% of the rest of your funds in these trades to try to get a quicker return, why not just try to learn with that 20% or prove a track record of six months or more using the 20%? while keeping 80% in a relatively risk-free area where it can appreciate. So what I'm saying, 80%, take that money, put it in the all-weather or all-weather two times allocation that I just spelled out in the previous slide, and then trade with the 20% of your funds. And if you're not into trading, if you're someone who's watching this and you're contemplating trading or not trading, if you're not into trading, then put all of your money in the all weather or all weather two times, two times leveraged. I mean, that's not advice. It's not a recommendation, but I'm just saying it's something you could do. Um, you could just place it there if you never, if you, if you don't want to take the, the risks associated with short term trading. Um, it's an idea. Again, I'm not telling you what to do with your money. I am saying, that's the idea behind what I'm talking about in the second step. The third step, um, after you buy that all weather or all weather two times allocation is don't touch it again. Um, other than rebalancing it annually, you're going to have some securities that appreciate and some that depreciate and they are no longer going to represent the proper percentages for your allocation. So you'll have to rebalance that annually. And what I'm saying is do that with 80% and then trade or try to time the market with short-term trading with the other 20%. And then the fourth step is to continue to pay yourself first and automate a process for putting income monthly into the all weather or all weather 2x fund allocation. You have to pay yourself first. You, you do. And if your trading is working out, you could take that money that you pay yourself um, and start putting it towards more short, short term trades. But if your trades are just breaking even or you're getting small losses or huge losses, um, then continue to just take that money and put it into the all weather allocation and let it grow in that way. 
with far less risk. And what that growth is going to do is it's actually going to offset any losses that you may have in your trading account. And I'm going to illustrate that more using these charts. So first, these, these are charts that I created. This is um, me exporting data out of my trading platform, creating the portfolio with the two times allocation and charting it against the S&P 500. So this is what that looks like if we're just comparing S&P 500 to the all weather two times allocation. Remember that standard deviation is now almost identical. So the movements up and down are going to be much similar, much more similar because we have leveraged everything two times um, in our all weather allocation. So that's the blue line. So you can see the performance over time and how the all weather outperforms the S&P 500. But here I want to take what I talked about in the previous slide with the trading insurance and say, OK, what if we have the all weather two times or uh, two times leveraged? So let's look at that and then let's compare it to having an all weather that's two times leveraged at 80 percent and then have 20 percent uh, for short term trades. And let's have a return illustrated of five percent a month. So what I'm assuming is. 20% of our money is being used to trade and that 20% is generating a 5% return every single month for a 60% annual return. All right. Listen, there are a lot of ways that I could have done this. I just chose five. It, it was arbitrary. Um, there are a lot of factors that can go into this that will change these charts. Um, I also assumed uniform distributions of those returns. So in real life, if you had a 60% annual return, it would not be broken up evenly 5% per month. But just for this illustration, I chose 5% very consistently monthly return. And I compared that to um, the actual all weather two times portfolio. But there's one thing that's affecting these returns and that's taxes. So if you look, you'll see that even though there was 5% monthly return on 20% of the account, it still barely outperformed the regular all weather two times portfolio by itself. And that's because year after year, I have, you have to pay taxes on that short term trading activity. And I assume those taxes to be 33% just because that's a good round number. It's less than I would pay in taxes, but it's more than some others would pay in taxes. So I just assumed 33%. Again, that number can change the outcome of these results as well. But I assumed 33%. And because that 33% is taken out of the gains each year, it does not appreciate nearly as fast as it would otherwise without taxes, whereas the all weather is assumed to have been purchased and not sold. Uh, just for disclosure, when you rebalance, you would have to pay a little bit of taxes on the all weather, and that is not taken into account on this chart, just because I didn't want to try to go through and manually rebalance historically for 11 years. But that that's not going to drastically affect what I'm trying to illustrate here, which is that they're very, very similar because of the increased amount of taxes you have to pay on the short term trading account each year, whereas the vast majority of the all weather fund will just be held um, at the original cost basis and it, it won't be sold. So you will not have to pay taxes yet. So it's able to grow compounding a little bit quicker. So this is a very interesting illustration because here I added a third line. So we have the all weather portfolio that's in blue, same as it had, was in the previous slides. And what we did here is instead of assuming a 5% monthly gain, I assumed a 5% monthly loss. All right. So there's two scenarios that show losses. The red line is a scenario at just a 5% monthly loss. You can see that if you start in January of, of 2010, you're going to make it to August, September of 2011, and the account will go from whatever it was to zero. No more money in that account, assuming a very uniform, consistent 5% monthly loss. Okay. I also assumed a uniform, consistent 5% monthly loss 
using only 20% of the available funds to trade and putting the other 80% in the all weather two times portfolio. This is probably the most important slide of this entire presentation because what this orange line shows is that if you do the same trading activity that created that red line, see the red line where the account goes to zero, which I have done several times in the past myself. Many, many traders I know have done this. Um, you never plan on doing it. You don't intend to do it, but this happens and it goes from whatever you put in there to literally no more money. If that same activity that, that took that account to zero is done with only 20% of the available funds while the other 80% is invested in an all weather two times allocation, you get the orange line. And let's assume you were a glutton for punishment and you continue to refund that account and lose 5% every month for 11 years. Here is your performance you still will have made about 170% of the initial amount of capital you put in your trading account after 11 years versus funding your account and taking it to zero and then funding your account and taking it to zero and then funding your account and taking it to zero again. I'm not being negative. I'm just saying a lot of traders do that because it takes for many people, it takes a very long time. Um, to not consistently lose money and then an even longer time to start consistently making money. And because so many people are convinced that they are going to make money so quickly, I was one of those people. That's how I know they are so convinced that they're going to make money so quickly. They want to put their entire account into a strategy or a series of strategies because obviously mathematically it will grow faster that way. But the growing part is assuming that you can actually trade profitably for a sustained period of time. If you haven't proven that to yourself, then what I am proposing as a possible alternative is to just use 20% of your account and put the other 80 into a, an allocation like the all weather or the all weather two times. Um, if you don't want to do that, Put the other 80% just in the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones or um, whatever country you're in, uh, a country, the country's index that you have access to. That is, that is, that is what I'm saying. And so on that note, for, for people who are outside of the United States, I know I'm talking everything, uh, talking about everything from a, from a, from an American perspective. That's just because that's the one I'm the most intimate with. Um, you can recreate these allocations based on the securities that you do have access to. So you don't have to use those exact ticker symbols to do something very, very similar. And you may have to get creative and you may have to massage the numbers a little bit. Or like I mentioned earlier, if you don't have access to, um, like dig, which is oil and gas, maybe you replace it with, um, something from the utility sector back test it yourself. Again, this isn't advice. This isn't me telling you how this will perform going forward. I only know how it's performed, um, in the last 85 years, which is the most amount of history I've seen on this. I'm only showing you the last 10 or 11 years of analysis, but this all weather the regular all weather, the two times leveraged ETFs weren't around 20 years ago, but the regular all weather portfolio um, can be back tested all the way back about 85 years. And that track record is, is, is very similar to the most recent. It's, it's very consistent. It appreciates the averages, you know, are about the same. So why risk a hundred percent of your money? To, to prove that, you know, you can trade or not. I wish I, I wished I had not made that mistake. I, I wished I would have done something like this. If I would have done something like this, I would have a substantially higher amount of money than I have today because of the number of times during my journey of learning to trade that I took accounts and just lost the vast majority of the account um, or blew the account up. And literally having 80% of the money into the all weather allocation could have not only brought me back to even, but brought me to a profit, even though I was consistently losing money trading.
short term. So it's just something to think about. All right. So let's talk about uh, another scenario just to illustrate this even further. Um, obviously, a P&L would never look like that orange line. What I did with the orange line is I just said, OK, let's assume a 3% monthly gain. Instead of 5%, let's look at what happens if you do a 3% monthly gain. 100%, let's just say you're not using the all-weather portfolio at all. You want to put 100% of your money and you make 3% monthly gain. Now, this chart, again, assumes uniform 3%. Um, so that's why you have that chart. And then I'm taking taxes out in January at 33%. And this is what happens. So even though you were successful, let's assume you're successful. You're one of the, 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 you know, the minority people who can successfully trade consistently year after year after year. And I'll say 3% monthly gain again. Warren Buffett didn't make that. He didn't make a 3% monthly gain. Paul Tudor Jones, Ray Dalio, Simons did. Simons did. Uh, Simons did better than that, but it made him, you know, one of, if not the best investor of all time. So I think it's gracious giving 3%. But if I give 3% and I just assume that steady rate for 11 years, the all weather two times leverage still outperforms it without taking any of that risk. Think about the time. Think about the effort that was put in. So again, something else to just think through and set expectations based on. All right. Again, just another illustration. All weather two times portfolio is in blue versus trading with taxes and trading with no taxes. So see a lot of people, uh, I'm back up at 5% annual return now. So I'm not at, I'm not at 36% annually. I'm at 60% like annually. All right. A lot of people assume that gray line is how their P&L will look because they don't take into account any costs. They don't take into account any slippage of orders. When they back test their strategy, they don't take into account um, the fact that those back tested results show 100% accuracy on entries and exits. And in reality, you miss the entries and you can't get to the exit. And even if you have something to set up to aut automatically trade for you, those machines have errors too. So you're never going to get a straight line like this. And this line also assumes that you never have to pay taxes, which the only way you would be able to achieve that would be through some type of tax exempt account, which most retail trailer traders, especially if they're shorter term traders are not are not using to trade. So the, the actual, um, the actual gray line is out because that, that line doesn't exist. And if we use the 5% instead of 3%, you know, we're on par with the best, with the best investor of all time, consistent 5% a month, then the orange line is your results. And you can see the taxes being taken out. And it's still not even that much greater than the all weather two times portfolio. And so that's a big assumption to make to assume that for 11 years, you can just make consistent 5% a month, you know, right off the rip, because if you can't, it's very likely um, that the all weather two times portfolio is going to outperform your trading results. So back to Buffett rule. Number one, never lose money. Rule number two, Never forget rule number one. Why does he say that? Math. So let's talk about the impacts of losses. And why does Warren Buffett say, look, don't lose money and just let's don't lose money? Because the biggest problem is, is when you lose money, whatever percentage you lost, it takes a larger percentage to get back to even. So if you lose 15% of the amount of money that you're trading, or investing long term from that lowest point, it requires an 18% gain just to get back to where you were before the loss. 20%, you have to make 25% to get back even. Let's just skip up to 40%. Assume you have a 40% drawdown in your trading account. A lot of people under the sound of my voice have had a 40% drawdown in their trading account. 
it takes a 67% return just to get back to where you started. And if you have a 50% drawdown, you literally have to double your account to get back to even. So if you have a thousand dollar account and you lose $500, you now have to double that $500 or have a 100% return in order to get back to a thousand. The math is really working against you there. It's very, very difficult. It would have been much easier to guard against that loss in the first place. 75%, you've got to make 300% return to get back to even. And if you lose 90% of your account, it takes a 900% return to get back even. That's why Buffett says what he says about losing money. All right. So let's do a little recap and I'll bring this to an end. So here are the steps. Inspiration. Learn from the greatest investors of all time in order to become the best investor that you can be. It makes sense. Expectations. Setting realistic expectations is the key to avoiding disappointments that could lead to a shortened trading career. Don't believe that somebody can make a certain return in the market unless they have a five-year track record to prove it that they can show here's here's five years of this return consistently and if they can do that then okay that makes sense but don't base your expectations on hopes Um, set realistic expectations I wish I could go back in time and tell myself that when I started trading Set realistic expectations. Don't be a dreamer when it comes to this. Work hard. Try. But don't set unrealistic expectations because you're setting yourself up for failure. And so, you know, you can go back to step one and the inspiration to kind of set expectations. What what did the greatest investors do? Cash flow quadrant. You got to learn that. Stay on the right side of the quadrant. Focus on creating a systematic business and learning to invest to grow your wealth. So after this, this this first part, I'm going to talk about investments. Um, In the second part of this course, I'm going to talk about the top right quadrant, uh, the owning of a systematic business. And uh, that's what's on the agenda as far as content goes. And I'm going to go start to finish. But the point is, is stay on the right side. 95% of all wealth comes from those systematic businesses. And it is so much easier to create wealth on the right side of the quadrant versus the left side of the quadrant. All right. Pay yourself first. You must learn to do this and you need to automate it. You can't just work constantly and pay everyone else around you and expect to get ahead somehow. There is a time where you have to pay yourself first. And the more you can automate that, the more consistent you can make it, the better. Um, It is something that we do in my household. It is a habit that I established a long time ago. It has served me well. You will find that even when you try to pay yourself first, You'll still end up having to dig into that money sometimes, even though you shouldn't. And what happens is you end up getting back to even and you think about, well, if I hadn't have paid myself first, I would have still needed that money and now it would be negative. So this habit is such a good habit because even under that situation where things are unexpected, you still just go back to where you were. And in the best case scenario, you're actually taking extra money and investing it into your future self. You're going into the future and giving your future self, your future family, everyone that depends on you, you're giving them a gift. And that's why you pay yourself first. It's not necessarily selfish if you're trying to use your money to help those around you. All right. Diversify risk. Don't let yourself lose your hard earned money. So if you're a new trader, short term trader, if you've just gotten into Forex or cryptocurrency or you're looking at stocks or options or you're looking at futures. 
If you've been doing those things for less than two, three, four years, or if you've just started, what do you think your risk is with that money that you're using to trade? Based on your limited experience, your limited knowledge, limited education, limited exposure, the risk is pretty high. And it is for all of us. It is for all all of us. And it's, it even stays high. Once, once you get more consistent, it stays very high. Why risk all of your hard earned money to figure that out? To, you don't have to use nearly as much. You don't have to have your heart set on getting rich tomorrow. And I know that for a lot of people, it's about how do I make the most amount of money in the least amount of time? And, and, I get it. It's easy to rationalize taking all of your money and putting it on a high risk trade uh, because it has the potential for high return. It's just that statistically that works out very negatively. It's very bad. Don't risk it. You don't have to risk it. If you if you find a winning trading strategy, if you develop the skill, the art of trading, if you're very good, you'll be able to figure that out with a small amount of money. Figure that out first, prove it to yourself first before you actually risk money on those sorts of things or a large amount of money. And then take the rest of your money and put it in a safe allocation. Use trading insurance. So again, if you're going to trade short term, manage your downside intelligently. And if you're not going to trade at all, then allocate your assets intelligently. A lot of people will never trade. They'll never actually go and figure out a market that they want to trade. And they'll, they, you know, there's a lot of people who like to look at charts and they like to talk about trading. Um, trading is sometimes a form of a club. You can find that it's, it's a cool thing. It's, it's, it's niche. It's, but if you never actually trade, you, you still have to have money. You still have to figure out what you're going to do with your money. How are you going to grow your money? And you can do that through business ownership. You can do that through um, owning and investing in real estate. You can do that through a number of venues. But if you're wanting to do it with securities, if you're wanting to do it with stocks and bonds, then allocate them properly and go back to that step below in E that says diversify risk. That money is important. You worked for that money. You earned that money. If it was given to you, someone else worked for that money and earned that money. They gave up something to get that. Be a good steward of it. Allocate it properly. And it's really not that difficult. Again, you don't have to have uh, a deep level of education to understand that. So those are the steps. Next time, I am going to go into business ownership. Um, I own several businesses of my own. Um, I have started businesses from nothing as far as so just a concept, an idea, and taken them all the way to the point of being marketable to publicly traded companies who acquire those sorts of businesses. Um, so I have had experience with this. I've had mentorship with this and I have about, you know, been doing that about eight years, um, and have some profitable businesses. And so I am going to share my perspective on it. It might not be the proper perspective. It might not be everyone's perspective, but I'm going to talk about the, what it's like to live in this quadrant, what it's like to operate in this quadrant and what it took to actually get involved in this quadrant, like how I was able to move from that E quadrant over that red line into the B quadrant. Um, there are certain steps that I took and there are certain things that you can do um, to get started in this. And I will be talking about this from the perspective of having no money um, and not taking out a loan and not borrowing money. So how do you start a business like this? Because it's what it's what myself I had to do with my business partners. We started businesses with with no money. And so there's always these people that use that as an excuse. You have to have money to make money. Um, you need money to start a business. No, you do not. 
You do not. Um, you have to have a knowledge of how to get that money, <laughs> but that knowledge comes first. And so you can go from not having any money to finding the money for a business um, without you having to work and save for that money. Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about those things. I'll, I'll talk about those things in detail. But then how do you start a business on a budget? Building websites, getting marketing out there, um, everything, inventory. There's, there's, there's so many things to talk about. So I'm excited about that next section. This section is a little bit long, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to spare any details. So this is, this is a course. This is something that I am creating. Um, I, I thought through if I could give my past self when I first started trading, if I could give myself a recording, what would I record? This is what I would record. This is what I wish I could go back and tell myself 11 years ago. And knowing what I know now, I believe that this information applied 11 years ago. Um, I know for a fact would have placed me in an entirely different financial position. I mean, just an entirely new level of, of, of wealth. It's just unbelievable for me to even think about. So that's, that's one of the points of making this video is if you're, if you are in those shoes, if you are in shoes similar to what mine were when I first started, this is what I wished I could have known when I started, because this is what I have proven to be true with my time, effort, energy, and money over the last 11 years. And, uh, I want to talk about the synergies between business ownership and, and, and being an investor. So lots of exciting things to come in the future videos. And one last little tidbit, if you made it this long, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'm contemplating actually starting a business live and recording the process of starting a business from nothing into hopefully a profitable business. If it's not a profitable business, it'll lead to being a failed business. And I'll share that, that process with you in my thoughts about it, if that happens. But, uh, yeah, literally uh, I'm contemplating recording the process of going from nothing. I'll share the idea with you and then I'll share how to get started every single step to take. Um, all the way till taking in the first amount of money. And then how do you market to increase that amount of money? So, um, that's something I'm very seriously considering because it's, it's one thing to talk about being a business owner, but it's a whole nother level to actually start a business live and take people along with you, um, as a teachable moment or an experience to share. Um, I just think that's a cool idea and I think I'd, I'd be willing to do that. So, Stay tuned for that, and uh, thank you for listening. We'll see you soon.